uh, it's definitely uh, something that's a big deal. Of course, there has been the kaput uh, mm -hmm. toxicant that has recently been okayed for use in Texas. I believe in February there was a press release, and I think sometime this spring it's going to be available for licensed applicators, if I'm correct. Correct. Licensed correct. applicators. And it involves use of warfarin, which is the compound that is used in like rat poison. Absolutely. All right. So just just here, let's compare. If I go buy rat poison here for a shed, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's is there any difference between the warfarin and the hog toxicant, and what I would get in terms of dosage size comparison, those kind of things? Yes. So um, the warfarin for rodents that's currently on the market is about eighty percent higher, eighty percent higher dosage than what's in the feral hog bait. Um, so that's one difference there. Um, when we talk about any sort of chemical, any sort of toxicant, um, we always say the label is the law. The information on that label dictates what you can do. So, you know, that's a big difference right there. The rodenticides are not labeled for use with feral hogs. But when you get into the label of the um, kaput feral hog toxicant, they have details on how to put it onto the landscape, but also how to release it in a way where it's feral hog specific. Mm -hmm. like, like everything we've talked about so far, once you identify your issue, and it's it's easier to identify when it's a pig causing the issue, you want to make it as species-specific as possible. So they have recommendations for certain feeders that only, for, for the majority of animals on the Texas landscape, only a pig's going to be able to open it. Gotcha. So, uh, of course, uh, the concern is for, there's a lot of concerns, people concerned about non-target wildlife with other tests of warfarin that had birds and everything things like that. Um, but um, there is, I believe, a chemical compound in there that would turn the meat blue or the fat oh, blue. Correct. So, yes, um, one of the concerns is, is obviously secondary toxicity, but specifically to humans. Because humans do eat feral hogs, um, they do harvest them, there is a dye built into the toxic bait that within three hours of consumption will turn the inside of the animal blue. Um, it'll turn the fat blue. It'll also turn fluid inside of the animal blue as well. So you can see... Um, photos of an animal that has been scavenged and you can still see from the fluids in the joints that it did consume warfarin um, ahead of time and that that blue dye will stay in the body until if, if for some reason it doesn't get a lethal dose mm -hmm. the blue dye will stay in the body until long after the warfarin has been metabolized now there's always like blue blue because we received a photo of the inside of a hog in the panhandle that looked purple Ooh, I haven't seen purple. All the photos I've seen so far, we, we've we described it as Smurf blue. And that that's the pictures been... I've seen, but there's definitely an entrance of this hog that's purple. Interesting. Yeah, I'll, yeah you'll I'll have to send me that photo. Very strange. I didn't know if it's like blue, purple. It's kind of like a hit or miss, you know. Everything I've seen is very, very blue. So, yeah, I'm interested to see that one. Okay, so you mentioned scavenging. Uh, could it hurt an eagle if it ate the hog that ate the toxicant? So we didn't test that in this work that AgriLife did. Warfarin as a toxicant has been studied for a very long time. And based on this dosage, if you do the math on it, mm. the manufacturers don't believe that there is risk to, there is a secondary toxicity risk to scavengers. Gotcha. Um, a concern that I have had is the collared peccary, you know, and because it's a very common in southern Texas, part of western Texas, and... Um, that's an animal that's going to eat a lot of the same stuff a pig does. So would that be up to the applicator to maybe make it javelina proof? Because that's a game animal. It is a game animal. You're right. And so in that situation, um, they need to follow the label. And part of the label, part of getting this toxicant onto the landscape and getting it effective, it does require a, a lot of boots on the ground. Um, in order to be successful, you're going to have to be filling this feeder every two to four days per the label. Mm -hmm. In some situations, you may need to be out there more often. And so as with any management technique we talk about, um, monitoring and observation is key. And a lot of times we're talking about that in terms of success. But if you're putting a chemical on the ground, it's your responsibility to make sure it's staying species specific. And so um, the label has the legal recommendations available, but... It's also a great, great responsibility to be monitoring that and keep an eye on what's going on on your property. In the study document that Texas AgriLife put out, it mentioned that there were numerous failures in the testing because people weren't monitoring enough. They weren't doing enough of uh, upkeeping the traps and those kind of things or the, the devices. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and again, with any sort of management we do with feral hogs, whether it's this toxicant or trapping, um, you have to train the pigs. And in order to train the pigs, you have to have 
the bait or the toxicant out there on a very regular basis. And so those pigs can go through a lot of corn or a lot of bait um, in a small amount of time. So if you're not out there monitoring it, if you're not refilling the feeders on a regular basis, if they go empty, yeah, you're not going to be successful because the pigs aren't going to identify it as a regular food source. So they're not going to come into it on a regular basis. 